Hello, this is Gabriel Custodiate of Watchman Privacy. Listen, I know why you're here. You're looking to escape the technocratic apparatuses that you see slowly enveloping you and restraining your freedom. In that case, the best thing you can do before listening to this episode is to visit escapethetechnocracy.com to purchase my privacy course on getting off the grid. This course is for everyone. It's the best privacy tutorial on the internet, and our shop has other things as well, books and toolkits and consulting, and we accept Monero and actual privacy throughout the checkout process. I do not take sponsors, I'm not part of a company, I don't have someone to answer to. So unlike 99.9% .9 of the people who talk about their subject, you can know that I'm pursuing the unmitigated truth as I see it. Go support you and me at escapethetechnocracy.com. Welcome to Watchman Privacy Torchlight Chats. I'm Gabriel Custodiate. I'm joined by my colleague Urban, with whom we've created our Escape the Technocracy brand. In Torchlight Chats, we discuss things that interest us. It's more conversational than the typical podcast. Not too conversational. This is not a fireside discussion. Our torch is pointed forward, scanning the horizon. We're always on duty, and thus, our watch begins. On this Torchlight chat, we're going to be discussing Ashigaru Wallet. This is a wallet that is cropped up by an anonymous developer as a replacement for Samurai Wallet, which has been taken down. Its code has been uh, seized. Its website has been seized. Other of its infrastructure has been seized by the powers that be, by the American government specifically. And this is somebody who's cropped up to fill in the gaps. So first of all, Urban, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So before we get into Ashigaru, let's talk for a moment about our struggles with Bitcoin privacy. So first of all, um, we're recording this. This is September 25th, 2024. The two developers of Samurai Wallet have gone through uh, initial hearing. Um, these things take a long time. So, but they're, they're kind of going through the process. We wish them the best. We encourage people to please keep them in mind, share the words, uh, donate to their cause if you can. We want these people to go free and we want them to be completely exonerated and their tools freed up as well. In the meantime, been, we've been talking, we've been going back and forth. We're actually, de we're actually developing a Bitcoin privacy course and it's been a real struggle. I, I have to say, Urban, we have, and especially you have tested a ton of stuff. And what I've noticed is that you have gained a new appreciation for what Samurai Wallet was doing uh, during this time of just experimenting with, with everything that is out there. It's, yeah, I, I tried pretty much every single option that works on mainnet uh, that is not like if it's purely in development then I, I won't try it i want something that works i have to say all of them fall short for different reasons and different problems i miss the simplicity and elegance of samurai everything in this app was made in in such a way that it all made sense and what was nice about is you didn't need to be geek about this. You didn't need to nerd out all those details because they figure out for you. And basically you could just use it as a normal wallet and in the background, it would do a lot of things. I will say this to, to, the, to anyone who is listening and is considering working on those projects and we need you developers. We, we need people to, to maintain those projects and to move forward. I would say two things. Number one, it is extremely important to have pools of the same denomination. That is like one of the most important thing. You need to have as few pools as possible. You need to force the user to choose between, I would say, five to, to six pools maximum of denomination. And that is extremely important. I won't go in detail why this is the case, but this alone ensure, uh, ensures a lot of um, robustness in, in your protocol. Uh, and the second thing is you must have post-mix spending tools. So like once you get out of your coin join, you need to have ways to spend them in an in a obfuscated way, in a, in a privacy enhanced way. And those are the two things that I miss the most. And you know, Samurai, was not just one wallet. It was multiple different wallets with different accounts built in one. And for the user, it looked like one wallet, but behind the scene, the funds were segregated between when you receive them, when you mix them, and when you spend them. And this is also something that is lacking in every other solution. I think only Market has something similar 
but then it has other issues. That would be the things that I miss the most. And if you take them separately, they seem not really important or not really useful, but it's the sum uh, of them together that makes this product very, very robust. And then finally, another thing is you need to have free remix. And I know the joint market people, they like the idea of, you know, rewarding people who provide liquidity. I, I have to say, I think this is bullshit. And the reason is simple. The only people who will provide liquidity if they get rewarded are professionals. And, you know, I, I let you think about, you know, who could be, who could have a financial interest into running something like this. I let you think for yourself. And if you let for free, it's going to take a long time. It's going to deter criminals from using it because the criminal, they want to go as fast as possible in and out, right? They don't want to wait weeks and weeks, if not months, to, to go through it. They want a quick and dirty way to, to just exit and, and dump their, their, uh, their deed. So at the same time, you're promoting people who really care about privacy and who are willing to provide liquidity for free, and they only get one thing in return, more privacy. And, and that, I think, was one of the most... It, it's something I did not consider, and I think it's Laurel MT from OXT who mentioned that when they were thinking about the game theory behind Whirlpool, that this is some of the consideration they had. But you know what? You don't have to follow all my advice. Just re-implement Whirlpool. Don't look further. Like, why trying to make something else? That's that's insane for me. Like. Just take the, the specification and just re-implement it. That's it. You don't need more. You don't need to, to go more fancy than that. Yeah, so that's my, my call for developers and hopefully people way smarter than me and who are uh, more than capable, I'm sure, of like producing code. I wish you all the best and, and I hope you will take this call. And it is important to have those tools and it is important to develop them. So yeah. One of the things that a lot of people have reached out to us regarding post Samurai Wallet shutdown is, as you were saying, Samurai Wallet was not just a regular wallet. It had all kinds of things going on such that when it shuts down and somebody's not running their own node, there is a lot of chaos that happens within one's wallet, within one's UTXOs. Yeah, so uh, to have a nice experience um, with all this account that we, we mentioned, uh, you need a pretty beefy, powerful server behind the scene for for the users. And the problem is, you could ask, why were they not asking everyone to run their own node to avoid this exact same problem? And well, the reason was very simple. First, uh, they made it and they didn't think that they were making anything illegal. And then uh, you want to offer a nice experience to someone who is new and kind of is learning along the way. But when it shut down the wallet, uh, the, the problem is for privacy reason, once you create the wallet, you cannot change the server. And if you think about it, this makes total sense because if someone get access to your phone and then sneakily goes in the Samurai app and change the server, they could then read, uh, know all your financial history. And that is a huge security risk. So the way it was made is if you wanted to set up a new server or a different server, you had to basically uh, delete the seed from Samurai and, and start from the beginning and then uh, put your own server. What was a security feature turned out into a nightmare because most people were completely confused, unable to change the server. And then the wallet was blocked. And in some cases, would not even uh, start because it was waiting for a server that doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, so this was like one of the aspects of the chaos uh, that followed. And But I will say, you know, your funds are, were still safe, as mentioned many times. And this is nothing compared to the countless exchange that went down and scammed people and stole money from people and never reimbursed a penny. Um, so, you know, yeah, you might not have been able to access it, but you knew that, at least hopefully you knew that your funds were safe. One of the things we've noticed about the post Samurai, there's a lot of weird things, right? And one of them is that Umbral 
the Umbral is a, a node. Um, it's kind of demonized for not being open source FOSS software, even though it's source viewable, you know, that which is not FOSS. But they're the only ones who are still running the dojo. What do you make of that? What other kind of weird things have you noticed? There was a lot of things that surprised me uh, during this whole thing. Similarly, uh, they had they were worried about Microsoft, who owns GitHub, that they would shut down their account because this happened to other open source projects. Ironically speaking, if their account was on GitHub, the code would still probably be there. Because in the case of Tornado Cash, Microsoft actually asked if it was okay to put as read-only the code, and, and this was allowed. And, and to this day, you can go and, and download the, the source of Tornado Cash. But of course, in the case of Samurai, when it was shut down, then the whole thing just went down. Everything, like also the documentation, all the stuff about the recovery. And yeah, so it was a bit tricky. But I think this also shows to whoever is running Ashigaru to not make the same mistake and hopefully be way more resistant. And if they ever get uh, shut down, to have ways for people to easily recover their phone. And I'm sure they are probably aware of this and, and uh, trying to, to do something about it. Just for people who are listening, you have no clue what we're talking about potentially. Samurai Wallet was a Android-only Bitcoin wallet, which had built within it some very ingenious technologies that allow you to obscure in a certain way your activity on the blockchain. The blockchain, as the last few years showed, is transparent and capable and certainly being surveyed by people. And over time, there can be patterns that are noticed from these otherwise anonymous chunks of Bitcoin that are on the ledger. So Samurai Wallet was was front and center making Bitcoin private and therefore close to being fungible. And they were shut down earlier this year, 2024. Um, and they were arrested for, anyway, we won't go into the details here. So we have Ashigaru wallet. And this wallet crops up in late September, 2024. And I'm just reading from their website, the Ashigaru open source project is happy to announce the release of our mobile wallet, which we forked from Samurai. The app is Tor only with an overhauled UI and UX flow for creating, restoring a wallet to prioritize connecting to your own Dojo server. Our website is available on both ClearNet, ashigaru.rs, and that's a Serbia domain, and as a hidden service, but you need to use the Tor browser to direct download the APK. And then they give the Tor onion link. We self-host our repo and the code is reproducible. As Samurai's infrastructure has an uncertain future, we have launched our own paynim directory with a fun new Pepe hash scheme and then they give some of their links here. Uh, online peer-to-peer -peer coin joins are available again to users using the Soroban messaging protocol in app. Further details on each of the above can be found on our website. We have no social media presence. If you like the project, please share the news. And for anyone on Keybase, please give our, and then they have their links. So by the way, very, very cute name, uh, Ashigaru. The uh, the people in, in Samurai and, and Ronin and all the rest, they're very clever with their names. Uh, Ashigaru is basically a like a kind of like a farmer in, in feudal Japan who was just kind of minding his own business, just kind of getting along. And, and one day he is, he kind of starts to participate in the war um, and quite effectively. And they even had guns. And so at this time in history, so a very, very fitting symbol, obviously. Uh, let, let's first say this. I think you'll agree with this, Urban, that this is, we're not recommending people just go out and, and use this wallet, wallet by any means. We're just talking about it. Uh, the Ashugaru developers, whoever they are, say themselves that trust takes time to develop. Uh, we need to audit the code. And we're going to talk about that here, the way to approach this, but we're not recommending people just go into it. If you're an advanced person, you know what you're doing. By all means, uh, start looking into it, playing around with it so that you can understand your thoughts, your your initial thoughts, Urban, for what was your reaction to this and what's the kind of the best way to approach it? Yeah, I think um, like uh, everyone, I was a bit surprised uh, when when I heard about it. And initially, very skeptical. And I get what why they are completely anonymous. And, and of course, uh, in the current environment, uh, this is kind of required. But at the same time, you know, it's cryptocurrencies. And you need to be, you, you need to, to have a bit of skepticism. Number one is, yeah, if, if you want to try it out, uh, create a new seed phrase. It's the easiest to not get into too much danger. Uh, maybe use it on another phone, not your main phone, if 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 you want to. 
Uh, be aware that you will need to run your own dojo. It will not work uh, if you're not connecting to a dojo. So you will need to run that. What I basically did is I waited a few hours and then uh, some people uh, clever than me doing some stuff that we are going to discuss uh, basically gave the green light that, yeah, this seems to be okay. This seems to be legit. And then I was like, okay, I guess I, I will try it. And I just created a new wallet and started playing around with it. And of course, it feels a bit like home. Uh, it's weird uh, in a way to to be back to, to the software that we all loved and, and used almost every day for certain of us. And I have to say, it seems that they are very serious because they did not just make the app work without the centralized coordinator. What they also did was that they made sure that a lot of tiny things like the UI that was not, you know, they were, they were like quality of life improvement. There is quite a lot of change in those. It's tiny things, but I'm sure it took, a, it took them probably a very long time to make sure that it worked in a way that is like nice and intuitive and snappy and, and all of that. Uh, that's a bit how, uh, you know, the past few days and I've been trying it out, you know, sending back and forth. Uh, and it seems uh, very promising indeed. And again, this is an APK that must be downloaded directly from them. And so you're not going to find this in the Google Play Store or Aurora or um, F-Droid or anywhere else. So this is only for advanced users. And the creators have decided to be anonymous, at least for the moment. That's no doubt understandable. But it does lead us to this question, Urban, of how you can trust something like this. And this is a very useful moment to reflect on how we come to trust a software because this is a perfect example of here you have a a cryptocurrency wallet right which is a field that of which for which there is many scams obviously and this is replacing a set of developers who have been arrested and it's available on a tor onion link and we don't know the developers and here they come out with a new piece of software so how does one come to trust a piece of software like this, uh, including starting to audit the code? It's a challenge. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. So there are a couple of things that uh, you can do to mitigate risks uh, of something like this. The number one is they are using Git, and Git is a software that allows you to manage uh, versions. It keeps track of everything uh, you are changing every line of code that has changed and you can see you can basically replay line by line what has changed between one version to another and you can go down to the character in, in the file so you can precisely see every single step that were taken the number one thing would be probably to download their code download the samurai code and then do what's called a diff which is to look at all the difference of the two projects and what has changed. And this massively narrows down the complexity of the task because now you just maybe have a few hundred lines, maybe a few thousand, but basically everything else you know is kind of trusted because it was used by Samurai. So that would be like number one thing. And there have been people who have done this, obviously. And if you do that, you will see that mostly some stuff in the UI change, and a few of the addresses in the back end uh, to point to the new server that they created. So that's that's one. Then the next thing is, of course, you know, the code could be very innocent, but uh, they could have built a malicious uh, APK, right? And this has happened in the past where you look at the source code, everything is nice, there is no backdoor. But then there is a special version that is built with a backdoor, and then this is the one that you install. And there, I mean, it's a, it's a bit tricky how to prevent this, but the best way would be, so like, I think what they did, and I, like, just disclaimer, I did not try this. So I basically trust what they wrote on their website, but is that you have a reproducible build system in place. What is a reproducible build system? It's... It's a system where when you compile the, the code, the uh, human readable uh, strings into machine code that is then run by Android, your phone, when you do this, 
this is the step where you know you can add secretly a backdoor. But if you do it in a reproducible way, it means that everybody who is building and compiling this code will obtain the exact same APK. And, and that is, in, in a very simplified way, what a reproducible build is. So if you do this, if you have reproducible build, you could check the code, then you could build it yourself, and then you could check that the checksum matches the checksum that of the APK that is on the website. So that is the way you would trust the APK that this was not changed. And finally, another thing that you would do after doing this. So, okay, what, what have we done so far? Maybe let's recap a bit. We have checked the difference between the code and we have checked that once built, the APK that we obtain is indeed the same as the one on the website. So the next step is to check the signature. And this is a weird one because the first time you check a signature, there is an inherent moment where you need to trust whoever published that signature, right? It's the first time that you do it. So in that case, what you would do is you would say, okay, we have done all of this. We take the message that contain the checksum of the APK, of the executable of the wallet, right? And what the Ashiguru team did is they said, okay, this is the version, this is the checksum, and this is our signature, and we sign it, just like you would sign on a piece of paper. And what you do is you take, you look that the checksum matches. If you want a checksum, it's a bit like a fingerprint of the file. You check that it matches, and then you check their signature. And after that, ideally, what you do is you keep the signature on your computer. Why do you do this? Because later on, if they publish a new uh, version, what you could do is you could check with the previous signature to make sure that it matches. Because if you go on the website and you download again the signature, an attacker could well simply put their own signature and sign the message themselves. So this is why, like, for the next version, you could check. Now, if the signature matches in the next version, all you would know, maybe the build is not reproducible, right? But all you would know is that whoever signed the first version also signed the next one. Whoever has access to the key. That's the only thing that you would know. But you know, you wouldn't check the reproducible build. You wouldn't check a lot of things that we did in the first one. I guess what will happen since this is a new project and uh, the Bitcoin community is quite sharp on those things is for the next few releases, I can imagine that there will be a lot of scrutiny to make sure that what is written in the code is what is running on your device. But yeah, in short, that's how you would do. And by keeping the signature on your computer, you can then later on check again to make sure that whoever signed it matches. After that, you have basically also uh, things like automated system. Now, they are not on GitHub, but for instance, GitHub runs automatically. Like if you say that you're reproducible, uh, GitHub will say, okay, I will try to uh, build and run to make sure that what you sign is actually what builds. And this stopped an attack on the Wasabi wallet. So there was a malicious uh, binary that was uploaded on the Wasabi uh, release page. And there was an automated robot that basically built the, the project of Wasabi and then realized that, oh my God, the fingerprint doesn't match. And this was stopped uh, before. I, I'm not sure if people lost money, but it was basically stopped after two hours because of this. Yeah, so this is a bit in short, like how you uh, verify and, and start trusting something like this. They also mentioned something very interesting. The first time you install it on Android, Android will actually keep the keys that you use to sign the program, right? And later on, if the key matches, then the pop-up when you install a new version, instead of saying, would you like to install a new software? It will ask you, would you like to update a Shigaru? So an easy, you know, let's say low cost way to check this out is if when you download the new version of Ashigaru, it tells you that it's installing a new software, then you should assume the worst because you already installed it 
and Android already started to trust this signature. So uh, that's a bit the chain. And yet this, those things take time. And I think transparency is key. The fact that it's open source, the fact that they publish the code, the fact that it's reproducible, this minimizes a lot. But I will say to our audience, feel free to revisit the episode we did about the XZ backdoor to show how you can include uh, innocent looking code that is in fact a backdoor. Like you should never, even with open source, you should never underestimate the potential for backdoors directly inside the code. Again, we're talking Ashigaru. This is a fork of Samurai Wallets. This is the very early days. In fact, it's not even uh, allowed to be talked about on the Samurai Wallet Telegram group. And so who knows what will happen of this project, but clearly somebody's making it. Clearly somebody has put a lot of love and attention into it. Doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's not a scam. Only time will tell. And we're only speaking really to the people who are at the, the cutting edge, who are going to go in there and not risk anything, right? Don't be going in there and restoring your wallet from Samurai and Ashigaru or, or anything foolish like this. Some people might be thinking, Urban, the main reason I used Samurai Wallet is what they might say is for the Whirlpool functionality. Now, the Whirlpool was the way that you could enter a pool with other other people. And this was the surest way of breaking any de deterministic links on the blockchain. Very great privacy or anonymization uh, technique. That is not up still. And that would require a lot of work for that to go up. So for some people who say, well, that's not included, why would I be interested in a Samurai Wallet fork? What reasons would people have to be interested in Samurai Wallet that is without Whirlpool? For the foreseeable future it's an excellent uh, question so assuming this is legit i could imagine people still having money stuck in samurai and they want an easy way to recover and they don't trust a uh, sparrow or they don't trust their uh, desktop they want something that you know runs on a phone this could be a way uh, to recover your funds again please do not do it now wait for a few months uh, to see what's the take of the community on this. Always be suspicious of things and be paranoid a bit, especially with cryptocurrency. There are so many scams and, and stuff like this, but this could be one usage. And then uh, another thing is like Samurai was way beyond Whirlpool. So you have things like two-person coin join uh, that you can now use. Now, you could always use those in Samurai, but without the server, you had to send QR code to each other, which is not really nice in a UI. What they did is by uh, changing the server, they made it in a way that you could you know, simply create, again, those type of, of transactions. And uh, this is like one of the things uh, that is... And there are so many tiny details that you don't even realize that are in Samurai. Uh, it, it's, it's just a very good wallet. Like I give you one example. Like As you said, Gabriel, we are preparing a Bitcoin course about Bitcoin privacy, and we are doing our own on-chain uh, surveillance, right? We were like, okay, let's pretend we are a, a blockchain analytic company and let's see what we can figure out in this in those transactions. And wh what you find when, when you focus in one transaction is you have something like, you know, one addresses that use an old version uh, that has a little amount and then another address that has the rest of the balance that uses the newest uh, address format. And, you know, if you're... If you think a bit about what you see there, effectively, you can try to predict the amount that was paid, right? Because some of the money went into this old address and came from a new address and then went into a new format address. Now, what Samurai does is if it detects that you're paying to someone that is using an old version, it will itself create an old version of an address so that on-chain it looks like someone is paying two people with an old wallet. I mean, this is just a simple, there are dozens of small things like this that try to make sure that you're not shooting yourself in the foot and try to add as much entropy as possible. And I will remind people, what Samurai is doing, and in this case, Ashigaru, is just what we consider normal in the fiat world that when you pay someone with a credit card, they don't get to see your balance and they don't get to see the history of your transactions. 
right? So I, again, I'm, I'm reiterating that since Bitcoin is, is a public uh, ledger. And it's a good time, I guess, to mention that whatever Samurai Wallet's team was arrested for, whether that was things not even pertaining to the, the running of the, of the wallet, whether that was comments they made on Twitter, or whether that was pertaining to running Whirlpool, this current team of Ashigaru is not doing any of that, right? So there's there's no reason to think that they're even making, quote unquote, the same mistakes as Samurai Wallet. What you mentioned just now is good that there's nothing wrong about wanting some privacy on, on Bitcoin. There's nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong as a user of using Samurai Wallet. Ashigaru, I mean, yeah, uh, it's not illegal to use Samurai to this day. Like, it's just a wallet like any others. But, you know, things are changing rapidly and we see uh, new legislation coming, trying to define a self-hosted wallet as unwanted, let's say, or, un, yeah, let's, let's put it unwanted. But I will say, uh, I don't know about Ashigaru not doing, I don't like the word that you used about mistake because they were just getting paid to provide some feature to the user. And, and I think it's a dangerous, slippery slope. Like we would have to check with Ricochet because they do have Ricochet and Ricochet had fee and Ricochet was one of the things that was put in the indictment. So, and, and this is something I did, I did not try Ricochet. So maybe, but again, I will reiterate that when you send a letter to, with the post or FedEx or UPS or whatever, they financially benefit from you, you know, sending this letter. Now, in this letter, if you use it to, you know, uh, scam someone or to uh, you are stalking someone and or whatever bad you're doing, no one in the right mind would say, oh, FedEx is benefiting from crime. That is a bullshit argument. No, they are providing a service and they get paid to provide the service. The person doing the bad stuff is the person sending the letter, not FedEx. So I, I, I just like, I, yeah, this lady from FTX. Her uh, charges were, uh, or like the court decided today that she will face two years in jail. And this is to have run one of the biggest exchange that went down and, and destroyed how many countless lives? I would bet some people like sadly ended their life. Or, or just had their, their finances crushed or any of the other obvious things that, that can happen from having your investments destroyed. So yeah, it, it is absurd. And when I, when I use the word like mistake, obviously, I don't, I don't believe Samurai Wallet made any mistake, moral or otherwise. So I'm not, I'm not, that's no judgment on my end. But let's continue here because there's other interesting things to discuss regarding Ashigaru Wallet. The web of trust they mentioned in their opening salvo. Uh, have you already covered that? Or do you want to say more about the, the web of trust? They say that uh, they talk about their key base and that this helps our users verify our public key by leveraging the web of trust. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a good, it's it's funny. We are going back in time. We are back to the crypto wars in in some ways. So when Phil Zimmerman released PGP in the nineties, in the early nineties, there was the whole problem is like how do you how do you discover encryption keys of order and how do you trust them, right? So let's say you and I, Gabriel, we want to to talk to each other. Yes, okay, we both have encryption, but how do we make sure that we talk to the proper person? Now, the idea uh, back then was that you would literally put your name, maybe a picture of your driving license or some stuff from your passport or like insane stuff like this in your PGP keys. And then your friend would sign them and you would carry those signature with you to prove that you are indeed who you say you are. So you, you would have, you know, your key and with your name, your address, your whatever date of birth, and then you would have other people signing and vouching for you. And you can imagine like everyone signing is basically like adding a bit of trust. And then you are also signing their keys and verifying and you build slowly pockets like this of trusted people uh, between each other. Now this never worked. This is a nightmare. Uh, it has several privacy issues. Like let's not go into detail why it didn't work. But yeah, in, in short, the idea was, I think had good intention, but in reality that, that was not really working. But the principle stays, you know, 
you are you have you know a, a known key and now you have people downloading this key and this is what they encourage and this makes it that if later on someone replaces this key then it's obvious because many many other people have this key and say yeah <coughs> no uh, there is something fishy going on which is why they ask you to download the key which is why I told you you need to trust them kind of like this first time and then later on if you have a copy of the key on your computer you can basically locally find and them using this word of web of trust i think what they want is simply people kind of doing what pgp was supposed to do in the 90s of course not with the driving license but more like everyone has a copy of the key and maybe you know other people sign their keys with you know like you could imagine like i don't know the uh, developer behind sparrow or behind other wallets that also include those key and 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 something like this and and this way you you slowly build and gain trust and we have seen this strategy like when you have zero trust like extreme environment like uh, in dark web forums and darknet market and and those type of stuff it is kind of the only way that you can slowly gain trust and and build a reputation and all, i think this also make it more challenging to scam people because once you have a good reputation it takes so much energy to build the trust that then you're kind of forced to not become malicious. So this is how, I mean, you could always turn bad, right? You could always do bad things, but this is how the game theory works. And, and you know, you, you would be surprised, like between random individual making voluntary exchange, the amount of fraud is very low. There was a statistic from eBay, and, and I know eBay is not a darknet market, but initially it was kind of like this. You know, anyone could just create an account and sell stuff. And something like 99.5% of transactions went flawlessly. So, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. We'll see uh, if, uh, I would say, uh, download the keys, store them on your server, and start to verify your software. This is also a good exercise, you know, uh, and I think it's always useful to know how uh, you verify. I will also quickly add that this is what Google and Apple and others do. Like all of this verification basically is what is supposed to happen by Google. And then your phone does this for you. But of course, because you need to download the APK outside of uh, Play Store, uh, you have to do all this verification manually. I would not be surprised if later on they add a F-Droid repo that would automate a lot of this. I would not be surprised. But for now, I think they just want to be a very lean, very flexible structure that doesn't require a lot of uh, energy to run. So a lot of people, Urban, might say, well, why, aren't everybody, why isn't everybody who's running a sensitive piece of software doing it anonymously? And that's because... It's hard enough to run software and develop it, but doing it anonymously, right, is a challenge A challenge added on top of that. What kind of challenges does the anonymous team of Ashigaru face and how do they confront them? So uh, if you're anonymous, first of all, you don't have access to a lot of tools, right? So like nowadays, most developers are on GitHub. GitHub is kind of like, think of it as like a LinkedIn or a Facebook for developer where you know it, it is a bit of a social media and you can you know you can comment code you can you can do like all of those things of course like there have been people manipulating github you know to distribute malware so now github has reinforced how you can register on their platform and they require kind of like a, an identity from you uh, or at least a, a, a plausible email and not just, you know, a throwaway email account or something. So that's like one example. And of course, you could say, why, why not just hosting your own Git server, which is what Ashigaru did. And the reason is simple, you know, most developer and professional developer, they have a GitHub account. And then they just, you know, like if they want to report something wrong with, the, with your code, they could just, you know, go with their account and click on the line and say, hey, have you considered this? And it's like super easy to do. But if you're using, you know, a Tor hidden service, you have all the slowness of Tor, you need to register an account on their platform. 
then they need to approve it. It, it, it creates a lot of frictions. Uh, this is not where most developer hangs out. It, it, it makes it just uh, much harder. But on the other side, it also enables other anonymous developer to contribute. You know, people who might not have contributed on GitHub because of privacy reason, and now they would contribute on Ashigaru. So it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. And then the other thing is, you know, how do you communicate externally, right? Like, you cannot use uh, Twitter, you cannot use Facebook, you cannot, obviously, you can't use LinkedIn. Uh, so you, you need to kind of build a, a network yourself. Telegram, we have seen they, they start, like they changed the, their terms and condition. So it, it, it is like this extremely slow grinding process to, to build trust, to maintain the project. And then you have all the infrastructure to run. So basically, it's a bit like running a darknet market just without the market aspect. But it's similar challenge. You know, you need server, you need resources, you need to pay for it. Uh, you have like all, all, all of those things and they take time and they take energy and that's that's challenging and i mean think about it it's like okay you create your onion url and then how do you publish this right how, how do you tell people on twitter to to post it and and to talk about it all of those things makes it incredibly challenging and i'm sure there are many great softwares out there that we don't even know about just because they are hidden like this, made by some anonymous guy, and no one really used them because there is no way to discover them. Hey, thanks for listening. Look, I could use your help real quick. If you could share this, engage with me in some way, leave a review anywhere, this really helps me to break the technocratic shadow banning that is happening with my brand. And of course, if you really want to escape the technocracy, go to escapethetechnocracy.com. Privacy tutorial series, books, consulting, and of course, you can leave a donation. Thank you very much. 